I feel that the world is so collectively lost right now. There's no hope for the world due to the interconnectivity of the world economy as well as culturally. This is heaven's divine reset, the divine reset that will correct the conscience of the world. Hey, my friends, this has been a lot of talk about the world today, not knowing how we're going to solve the problems. Many people seeing, hey, there is no solution to this that's man-made. We need a divine intervention. And then you get to all the talk about the warning, uh, this event that's supposed to come that is sort of an illumination of conscience, shows everybody, uh, you know, what they've done to let people have one more chance at uh, setting their uh, their lives right so that they can face what we're in. Because right now it seems like everyone is lost. Um, is there a divine reset coming? Well, there's our next guest is someone who's been writing about this for oh, over 30 years, long before the Great Reset was known. He was writing about a divine reset. He's got a new book out called Garabandal, talking about the Great Divine Reset. We're going to talk in this episode of John Henry Weston Show about Garabandal with Ted Flynn. One thing to note, though, Garabandal is not approved, but it's also not an unapproved. There's three categories. There's approved, like Fatima and like Lourdes and so on. But there's also things that have been condemned by the church. But there's that middle category, which is not approved and not condemned. That's where Garabandal sits right now. But as you'll learn in this interview, Padre Pio supported Garabandal. So did, believe it or not, Mother Angelica. Stay tuned to this episode of the John Henry Weston Show. Dear LifeSite family, Lent is a time of reflection and renewal, a time to examine one's own conscience and ask the question, are we each doing enough in how we stand for life and for truth? Every day, LifeSite News stands for the truth and shares it with millions of people worldwide. When others closed their eyes, we kept ours open. When others deceived themselves, we prayerfully sought the truth when others were intimidated into silence, we spoke out boldly. Truth is what we live for. It's the air we breathe. We are in the middle of our spring fundraising campaign, and I humbly ask that you please consider including LifeSite News in your Lenten financial almsgiving. It is your support which makes the continuation of LifeSite News' mission possible. May God bless you. Ted Flynn, welcome to the program. Thank you. Let's begin as you always do with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, Ted, the topic of your new book on Garabandal about the warning and the great miracle is of great interest to people today because I think... Everybody can see we're dealing with situations in the world, but also in the church, that are beyond any kind of normal human political solution. We're looking for divine intervention. The one that's promised, the ones that's talked about by uh, Padre Pio, but also by Garabandal, is this warning. If you wouldn't mind starting there, I know you have a huge background in terms of prophecy, what has the messages coming from heaven working explicitly with those messages that have been approved uh, and those that are not condemned. Um, but start off, tell us what is the warning? What are the um, points for people to take home about this divine intervention that's promised from heaven and the hopes for it? Well, the warning is a general term in English. The, the Spanish term is a viso but it also has other names to it that are that are interchangeable and still accurate. One is called the judgment in miniature. Another is a life review, uh, as, or as I say, the warning. And so there are different there are different names for this. Uh, the illumination of conscience is probably the one that's talked about the most. And there have been many people. In, in church history that have, especially the last three or 400 years, that have actually spoken about an event like this. And I'd like to say right off, my methodology in the book, I mean, the book is 324 pages. You can't get into everything that was said over four years and four months. 
where the Blessed Mother appeared 2,000 times to these four girls, either individually or collectively. So my methodology in the book, which is different from many other people's approaches today, speaking about these events, is I just stayed what was said with, with right there from 1961 to 65. I didn't give my opinions on a lot of things. I presented the data and the, the facets of the diamond, you could tilt it and you could look at it from different direction of light. But the warning is, is generally this. It's where every single person in the world will see this, their state of their soul as God would judge it at their judgment. Now, over the last 30 plus years, I have probably spoken to somewhere between 25 and 30 people who have experienced the warning because a book I did in 1993, uh, The Warning and the Miracle of Garabandal, called The Thunder of Justice, it was actually very much center of that, and it became the beating heart of the book over time. So many people have approached me over a period of time where every single person has the same stories. It's, in essence, the greatest event that they've ever experienced in their entire life. Two, they can't put words to it. Three, it takes really years sometimes for them to process it. Four, they don't even tell those uh, around them, the closest people to them, including their spouse, about the event because they can't explain it. It's that profound. I've met people who had radical conversion in their life to where they just can't talk about it. And, and it's think of like on your iPhone to where you're going through your pictures and, and, you know, you can do either fast or slower, or you can just zoom through them. But it's it's really a life review. A lot of people who speak of it as a near-death experience, it's much, much greater than that. They see literally the sins of omission in their life, commission, and it just becomes the single greatest event in their life that they can't even explain. And so my feeling in, in why I did this, there are certain prophecies now that are coming more into view that, that weren't in the past. But I feel where, you know, from scripture where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. I feel that the world is so collectively lost right now. There's no hope for the world due to the interconnectivity of the world economy, as well as culturally trillions of dollars in foreign exchange every day going over swift codes in the internet for all sorts of transactions. And due to this interconnectivity of cultures, I feel this is going to be where the world is talking about a great reset. This is heaven's divine reset. That's what this is. That's why the subtitle is the divine reset that will correct the conscience of the world. There's no so my my premise is there's no hope for the world any longer to rectify this yeah. cultural downward spiral that's really accelerating right now unless God intervenes. And if I've gained one thing from this book, uh, many people that have just been reading it over the last month or so, it's new that they see the hope in it. That in essence, God has a plan. That's what they're now seeing. Heaven's not going to let the remnant, you know, uh, go to a period of such deterioration and, dis and decimation that there's no hope. This book is about the hope, and trust, love, and mercy. That's what this book's about. And that's what Garabandal is about. It's about the hope for mankind that God will act to correct this state of, that we're in. Because all through scripture, God always protects a remnant. That's a scriptural principle. There's always a remnant that that is protected. Indeed, it would be very scary. You know, some of the quotes from Jesus in the scriptures, you know, when I return, will I find faith? Um, when we saw, you know, countries which were promised to retain the faith, like Portugal uh, and, uh, and Ireland with St. Patrick sitting on the rock forever, you'd think, oh, the faith will be retained there. And then they went pro-abortion. And it was stunning. How, how is that possible? Then it made you think, how small will the remnant be? Because it does seem like it, it's it's right now uh, the, the numbers are are shrinking in a way that you, you never thought possible. The idea of the warning 
stunning in so many respects. Some of the people I've heard talk about who have had such things talk about how they see all of their sins throughout their lives in the light of Christ. And it makes it so much worse. When I was mean to someone, I was mean to Christ and they could see it. When I made fun of someone, I was making fun of Christ. When I was sinning against my spouse or whatever, I was sinning directly against Christ. So all of that, um, and it, it is a horror for the soul in some ways, but also great grace because they, they, they are given another chance. Um, and uh, this happening on a worldwide scale is really the only wake-up call that can ever get us at least to have some recognize once again the supremacy of God and the the possibility of hanging on to the faith. But tell us, what specifically do the messages say that pertain to this? And what's your feeling on the times we're in and, and the, the, the proximity to such a, this great act of assistance, I'll call it, that that, that the Lord will give the world, uh, you know, to, to bring us to some hope? Well, um, it's interesting you say that. I mean, you know, I, I feel that I, I felt that Garabandal, the messages of Garabandal in particular, which there are a lot of other messages that when you read them, which I don't mix and match by design, but everybody will see that there is very great similarity to certain aspects to La Salette, Aki to Japan, Fatima and others. And so we know that things are said and then they happen and then there's the if then clause. But in terms of the warning, uh, I feel that more and more people are being receptive. I felt the material, now I've been, I first heard of Garabandal in 1984 from a friend at church who has, whose family had been very close to the Lo, Joey Lomangino's family. And that's how I found out about it. And I've always kind of had this fascination with it because it, it seems to just answer so many things that you can't really put your finger on in other places. And I feel the people most receptive to this message now are the remnant. And I think phase two are going to be a lot of people that even like the secular media are, uh, right now is saying, which is fairly abnormal for them, that this seems to be a level of evil that the world hasn't seen. So that's yeah. odd for basically a person who is unchurched in the secular media. And something, and I felt that'll be the next phase as they watch this spiral, moral spiral accelerate. And, you know, what do we do? And I saw a glimpse of that just about two and a half weeks ago. Um, I, somebody sent me the podcast that Joe Rogan did with, uh, with the football player Aaron Rodgers. And so they were talking about the state of the world. And I was stunned, in essence, that Joe Rogan said this. But to me, it's the next it's the next sign that things are moving in this direction where Joe Rogan, who doesn't exactly speak like St. John the Apostle when he speaks, um, he uh, or any any other saint for that matter, when he talks like the way he does, he literally said on his podcast, which I think may be the largest viewed in the world, he said, we need Jesus to solve these problems. And then so I think the third phase of openness is when the events happen themselves. But per more the question the, and aspects of what the warning are, the, uh, there aren't a lot of there's not a lot of data points on specifically the warning. And Mary Lowley, who died in 2009, knew the year of the warning. But, you know, she doesn't necessarily have to be around to announce it. And so it, it, we're told that the warning will be like two heavenly bodies colliding. The warning will be seen and felt. People have to remember that. The warning will be brought about after the church will have something, quote, something like a schism. And the warning will happen after the chastisement has run its course. So mm -hmm. we, we know that you know, um, we can see more of these things in view. After being around this now for literally decades, uh, I decided to, to do the book when I saw two prophecies come more into view when a pope visits Moscow. That was one. And, mm -hmm. and the other was that the warning would happen after a synod. 
And so now we knew that we're in the third year now of the synod. So I pretty much lived like a hermit and in, in, in reclusive for over a year to, to basically do the book because these things are now more in view and anybody watching the news can see that we're getting closer. As I look at the body of prophecy, I don't think that we're there just yet for anybody who really studies it, but it's obvious they're clearer to see now than years before. Yeah. Um, your take on this, having written on this issue for, I think, more than 30 years, uh, is is one that is uh, should be very uh, listened to because you've studied this issue uh, so much of your life that um, you're probably one of the foremost experts in the world, if you don't mind me saying so, uh, because these are difficult issues, that, but very few people go into them with the depths that you do. Um, and so hearing your, your take on that is, is very interesting. Give us, if, if you will, some of the key messages, as you say, in, in the words they used, uh, that indicate to us what to expect. Well, if we want to get into that, I guess we could get into uh, what would be called, what I called, uh, let, let's just back up then and start a little bit to start from the beginning. And we can get into mm -hmm. what I call the bookends. And so we can get into, and it's very interesting if the Blessed Mother appeared over 2,000 times, there really aren't a lot of messages that became public. And there were certain times in the village where the villagers would get somewhat upset. Well, what was said after all of this time to where the Blessed Mother would literally uh, talk to the girls either individually or as a group or one or two or three of them or whatever for several hours on end, but yet there were no messages. On a personal basis, I thought the girls were in a discipleship mode. And they always yeah. spoke about how they were very good friends with her. They talked about how the day went and it was a friendship. But if we want to get into, you know, some of the the early part in June 18th, 1961, the Archangel Michael appears to all four girls, 11 and 12 years old. On July 1st, St. Michael announces that Our Lady would appear as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. On July hmm. 2, on the Feast of the Visitation in our calendar today, but in the old liturgical calendar, I think this is absolutely huge. It was the Feast of the Ark of the Covenant. And today, mm. uh, as we know, Our Lady is the Ark of the New Covenant. So mm. there are three interior calls to summon them to a spot. And consistently, all three appeared, all, all of the girls appeared at the exact same time. And the mm. girl could never explain it. And this gets back into the explanation when you're into the supernatural realm, that you really can't explain how these things really happen. But no matter where they were, they would just appear. So per your question, let's get into what I call the bookends. And, and this is kind of a macro, you know, 5,000 foot view of our culture, the church, the state, and the world. And it explains things. On October 18th, 1961, literally just several months after the first apparition of, um, of July 2, the, uh, the Blessed Mother said, Many sacrifices must be made. Many penances must be done. We must make many visits to the Blessed Sacrament. But first of all, we must be good. Now listen to this word, if. It's the conditional if, this is my me speaking. If we do not do this, punishment awaits us. Already the cup is filling. And if we do not change, we will be punished. So if there is a conditional punishment. Now, mm -hmm. here's the other bookend, um, you know, on June 18th, 1965. She said, as my message of October, meaning October 18th, 1961, has not been complied with and has been made known to the world, I am advising you that this is the last one. Before the cup was filling, now it is flowing over. Many cardinals, many bishops, and many priests are on the road to perdition and are taking many souls with them. Less and less importance is being given to the Eucharist. So listen, look at just how emotive those words are and what's being said there. And then she said, 
you should turn the wrath of God away from yourselves by your efforts. If you ask his forgiveness with sincere hearts, he will pardon you. I, your mother, through the intercession of St. Michael the Archangel, ask you to amend your lives. You are now receiving the last warning. I love you very much and do not want your condemnation. Pray, pray to us with sincerity and we will grant your request. You should make more sacrifices. Think about the passion of Jesus. Hmm. Now, now, if, if we want to get into literally the beating heart and, you know, the brain and the liver and the vital organs, there were two more messages that were very, very significant at Garabadal, above and beyond others in terms of the, the general tone and spirit of our culture and what has to be done for any sort of amendment. And we have to remember there is no restoration in Scripture unless there's repentance. Mm -hmm. uh, repentance has to come first, and we all know Jonah and Nineveh and uh, some other instances. But there were two significant messages which are called the Knights of Screams, plural, the Knights. These elements, it has to be understood, there's two aspects of it. One is absolutely supernatural, like literally a, a, a Red Sea parting. That had never, ever been seen before. Another one was the, the miracle at Fatima with 70,000 people, according to the New York Times itself, literally with the sun hurtling to earth. So there's a supernatural element to these chastisements that is very, very significant. And then there's the other aspect that I always you know use of man's sin where Isaiah 59, 2, it has been your sin that has separated you from God. So there's two aspects of it, of our own sin, and then something happening supernatural. And both nights happened at 10.30 p.m. on the first night of Screams, June 19, 1962. The girls were shown in a vision that rivers would turn red with blood. The church would be persecuted and decimated. Its buildings will no longer exist as they once did. Professing your faith would be very difficult and the sacraments would be difficult to receive. The girls were heard crying out, stop telling us those things. Things. Wait, wait, everyone should confess. They should get ready. When it appears all is lost, the warning will come. Their tear-stained faces and incoherent speech immediately afterwards attested to the trauma experienced by Jacinta Mary Lowley and Mary Cruz during the first night of screams. For some time, the details of what they experienced were not divulged, but over time, the details did emerge. So that's kind of normal, A lot of, like even with Sister Lucy at Fatima and other apparition sites, more things get filled in over time. And that's fairly normal, but it wasn't divulged early on. <clears throat> so the, shortly afterwards, Hacinta and Mary Lowley confirmed the coming chastisement. The Virgin told us that we do not expect the chastisement, that without expecting it, it will come since the world has not changed. And she has already told us twice, and we do not pay attention to her since the world is getting worse and it should change very much and has not changed at all. Prepare yourself, confess, because the chastisement will come soon if the world continues the same. So again, the word if. It's, it's our conditional response if there's amendment. So now on the second night of screams, which was June 20th, the next day in 1962, on the vigil of Corpus Christi, there was another horrifying vision that lasted for three and a half hours. The girls saw destructive things happening in the world at a future time. Mary Lowley Mazan said, we saw rivers change into blood, fire fell from sky, and something worse still, which I am not able to reveal now. Three of the girls were shown that the great chastisement of fire that would come if humanity reverts to its evil ways after the grace of the great miracle. The girls were heard saying, oh, don't let this happen. Don't let this come. May everyone go to confession first. The girls wept. Don't let this happen. Don't let this come. Forgive us. Don't let this happen. So these girls were clearly for very young kids seeing things that they were absolutely never could have ever conjured in their own mind they would see. And it is interesting, the very next day, the entire village went to confession. 
Hmm. So there's wow. the power, there's the power of a very strong message. And so on June 23rd, Our Lady gave Jacinta and Mary Lowly the following message. The Virgin has told us that if the world continues the same and it has not changed at all, few will see God. Let's get back to what you just said, quoting Luke 18 and 8. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth, which you mm -hmm. started out with. So few that it is causing the Virgin great sorrow. How unfortunate that the, that the world does not change. The Virgin has told us that the chastisement is coming. As the world is not changing, the cup is filling up. How sorrowful is the Virgin, although she does not allow us to see it. Since the Virgin loves us so much, she suffers alone. Since she is so good, everyone be good so that the Virgin will be happy. She has told us that 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 those who are good should pray for those who are evil. Yes, we should pray to God for the world, for those who do not know him. Be good, be very good. So it, again, this gets back to the a supernatural. You can see the supernatural elements of that as well as the corporal in our own life and in the world. Indeed. So there's these three elements, the, the warning, the great miracle, the chastisement. The chastisement is conditional, but it, it seems that since she appeared in 61, then in 65, uh, you were saying that the, um, or is it 65 or 62? Um, I can't remember, but she was saying that the, the cup was filling up and then that it's overflowing already. <laughs> If anybody examines what was going on in 61 compared to today, not only have we not paid attention, not turned around, it's gone so much further and so much worse that it's almost incomparable. Uh, it, it's, it's stunning how much we've progressed down a road of sin. So, you know, from, from my perspective anyways, the chastisement seems very much like it's coming. Um, it's predicated. Um, uh, is, is it not? I thought it was predicated with the warning before, but you seem to indicate no. The chastisement is coming first. Where, where, how does that? Uh, how does that line up? Well, well, um, it you know uh, it was said that you know, uh, and I make a point of this, and I may be a little different than many people because I look at this so globally. I mean, we know that this message was asked to be for the entire world. If you know it has people have to pay attention to it. It wasn't for just some little remote village in northern northwest Spain at the time, at that time who had about 300 people. So mm -hmm. this was meant for the world. So you know we're in a situation where I look at this that in essence the warning, the miracle, and the permanent sign. We know they're all so close together. And some visionaries, which I don't get into, have literally sometimes a matter of week or months after. I stayed with the with what the girl said that it would be within one year from the warning to a miracle. So we know that's not a long time. It could be literally less or or right at if you want to go from a legal standpoint, 365 days after. But you know, heaven's going to do what it's going to do. So uh, I don't get at all into any predictions of what I think when mm -hmm. but I do present the differences of opinions on things of what people have said. But if you want to just take a look at one thing on proximity of when things are going to happen, we know that towards the events, it would be like an invasion of communism. That the, hmm. Now, you have to look at that. The world just doesn't go communist between just before the warning or after the warning or before the miracle or just after. This is a generational creep that we've been looking at. So I don't look at, you know, if you look at three acts in the same play, there is absolutely things that take place within that act. But by the end of the play, it all makes sense. And so, you know, I've been beating this drum now for well over almost 40 years that the United States and much of the West has incrementally been going been going communist. In the 1930s, the head of the Socialist Party of the United States realized that Americans in the word found the word socialist abhorrent. So they changed the narrative on their terms to control it. And they use the word liberal and progressive because they know the United States citizens would, would reject that. 
So if you want to go back and even look at the United States in 1962 and 1963, we removed prayer from the classroom and the Bible from the classroom. That is a communist act. And so the whole thing is they knew they couldn't confront the United States uh, like they did with the Bolsheviks and the Bolshevik Revolution. It was too violent and too quick. And that's what even um, Gorbachev said at the Presidio after the the Soviet Union fell. Had we not been so aggressive so early and followed the principles of Antonio Gramsci, we would have been much more successful long term. And so we have to basically get into the concept of what it really means to be communism, because what the United States and basically Marxist socialists and communists have done, they've never really raised their head for their true intentions and worked behind the scenes in stealth by infiltrating all of the key organizations, whether it's academia, media, corporate, and many other aspects, uh, and especially media where they control it. And so it, it, it's the question of understanding the narrative of how we have been like the frog in the water in each passing year. We don't even know we're boiling to death anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have, in essence, through legislation, become administratively communist. And we have to look at that for what it is right now with what's happening in the schools, with LGBT and everything else. This is literally a Marxist agenda. And even Marx said, you to take over, you have to saturate that, that nation with sex. <laughs> so they've been and effective. We certainly there. And we've been, they've been effective. It's been a Marxist takeover of the United States from within. And I think it's coming to an end now. I think they've overplayed their hand and people are seeing it. Frankly, for people like what you guys are doing and exposing all of this for exactly what's happening in the world. And a lot of a lot of media, the alternative media is, is showing people for what this really is. But we have people very much really dug in right now culturally. Anybody listening to this, they can be at a wedding, a funeral, a social gathering, a birthday party at a country club, a restaurant, anywhere. And if there is a group of people that you really don't know, it's it's only a matter now of minutes before it'll usually be the liberal, progressive, fascist, communist, Marxist, whatever. They'll say something. And then if you uh, outrageous, you know, like, you know, I hate what they did with, you know, Roe versus Wade with the Supreme Court or anything else. They'll, they like migration. They like what's happening at the border. They'll tip their hand first because they're much more aggressive in their speech and their manner. And then if you respond to something that they don't want to hear, they'll tell you immediately. And in essence, you will intellectually be canceled and emotionally canceled right on the spot to where they don't want to deal with you anymore. So we very much have a bifurcated culture on the direction of, of the way we're going right now. And there isn't any conversation that I'm seeing right now with a group of people that that is not taking place. Even if the person who is a believer doesn't even speak up first. Hmm. Unbelievable. And I think so that's going to, I think it's going to increase, not decrease as, as uh, emotions get much more raw in the future. Yeah. So, if you can work out for us this this difference between those who believe that the the warning will come first, then the chastisement, as opposed to those who believe that the the chastisement comes first and the the warning afterward. Well, you know, uh, I've traveled an awful lot in my career, and I remember even being in Sarajevo in 2016, and you could still see you know 50 caliber uh, holes in the buildings there as well as other places in Bosnia, and whether it's even in Mostar, you saw the same thing. The chastisement to me is that if you are living, in, you know, we're right now in the West, and by and large, there are many more freedoms than other parts of the world, but we know there is very difficult times in the world. So what does it mean to be a chastisement if you live in the Sudan or if you're being murdered for your faith in Nigeria, where they're murdering clergy left and right because it's a Muslim-run government with its president, 
and in the Sudan where every single person puts their hand on the Quran who works in the military. So uh, as it, with a white glove on the Quran. And so, you know, the chastisement to me is an ongoing process. So if you were in a one, let's just say, you know, the Ukraine, which had 44 million people at the beginning of the war, and, that, you know, however many hundreds of thousands are either dead or wounded or maimed or whatever, and the those displaced where they estimate the displaced now is over 10 million. So it. Mm-hmm. If you're in the Ukraine right now or in certain places, maybe on the on the Russian border with Ukraine, is it the chastisement? So I don't look, you know, does the chastisement literally means that we have to see from the, the Canary Islands, you know, off the coast of Africa and in the Atlantic to where literally 100 miles of of the of the American coastline is washed away? What does it really mean? So the chastisement, I think we're in the process of the chastisement in many, 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 many parts of the world already with the suffering, the corruption, the war, the deceit, and basically the vile behavior of many, many people. You see very clearly the connections that you made to uh, La Salette, to Akita, because that message that you quoted before about the betrayals of the priests and the bishops that that echoes so well with Akita and uh, and with La Salette, um, they too talking about the infidelity of the clergy. Um, what in in your perspective? What is that? Um, the severity of the betrayal of the clergy to Christ, to his church, to his church's teachings. Um, and where do you think we're at in the world today on that score? I think the, you know, uh, I've always been amazed um, that so many clergy have failed to speak out. If I have a lament now as an adult, as people who either saw what was going on in the seminary when they were there, because I've spoken to so many priests over the last 40 years of, of the shenanigans that they saw going on. I think if I have a major disappointment, it's how they have remained silent. Hmm. And so I, I think that the, the the world is basically going the way of the church and vice versa. And if you look at the Old Testament, it, Yahweh always actually punished the clergy first for them not speaking out. And so I think this gradual decline is increasing. And I think due to priests being canceled, I think there's increased fear to where I literally spoke to a uh, a priest yesterday who was uh, he was doing masses of reparation. And he asked, you know, in, in terms of looking even at the holy face, a novena. And, and what good could I be if I now challenge my bishop? So there's been this aspect of so much of the clergy has been complicit by not speaking out. And we're here. Could you imagine when Roe versus Wade or even before in 1973, at least in the United States, and we literally just saw it just this week. Um, France enshrine abortion in their constitution. So, mm-hmm. so you want to talk about the clergy not speaking up, but I'd like to say this, and in, in, even in defense of the clergy, we have, I, I can't speak to other countries, but we have over th- uh, 350 million people in the United States, and we have X number of hundreds of thousands of clergy. We know, I think there's 400,000 masses a day being said in the United States, give or take, so it doesn't matter. But um, could you imagine if just the people spoke up more of people like you doing what you're doing and the things that we're doing now, if more people spoke up? And could you imagine if the clergy all w- walked arm and on, arm down Constitution Avenue in, in, in actually defiance of what government was doing with all the bishops and the cardinals? But it's very easy. It's like in an administration, um, in any government administration, there's something called the plumb book or schedule C's. Those are the government presidential appointees. Some need Senate approval, others don't. Most are just appointed. 
There's roughly 4,000 of those in any U.S. administration that are appointed, but there's just one president. And everybody speaks about President Biden or President Trump or President Bush or Obama or Clinton. It's always just the president. But there's thousands of people behind that person enforcing the rules and regulations in basically the, the types of policy that that White House is looking to implement. It's if I could say one thing to the to the question of clergy, I think due to just the sheer numbers, people need to begin to speak up. You know, the truth if spoken by one is still the truth. You know, and if you want to look, you know, if you want to look historically speaking, and even in the time of Henry the Eighth, with uh, Sir Thomas More. Only one bishop in all of Britannia, at that time it was the British Isles, England, Scotland, Britain, only one bishop came to Sir Thomas More's defense. So here's a question per, per yours, how many bishops have come to the defense of Bishop Strickland that you can point to? Yeah, and that, not a single, not a single one in America. This is the this is the super sad thing. Uh, we are uh, an old friend of mine, a leader in the pro-life movement in England. He said once, abortion would end tomorrow. It will end as soon as the Catholic bishops decide they want to end it. And that's a stunning statement because if you think about what's gone on in America, um, the opportunity to stop abortion was always there. In fact, still is it's waning now. But the actions like Archbishop Cordelion took, one of the very few in America, Cardinal Burke took it too, uh, and both, by the way, virtually canceled for doing so, of denying Holy Communion to politicians who are pro-abortion and profess to be Catholic, um, is huge. If they said, like the Church would allow them to, that anyone who votes for pro-abortion politician would be automatically excommunicated, um, like abortion would end. But they choose not to do that. And when they do do it, do you remember when after a decade of discernment, Archbishop Cordelion finally said that Nancy Pelosi is not to receive Holy Communion? She went shortly thereafter to the Vatican, where at a papal mass she was given Holy Communion. And the same day that she received Holy Communion at the papal mass, Pope Francis issued the document Desiderio Desideravi, which is a document called out for heresy by numerous bishops, because it says the only thing necessary for to receive Holy Communion is the faith. And that is contrary to the teaching of Christ and the Church um, and the Catechism. But nonetheless, it was said now in a, in a papal document. So the, the confusion is so massive. But even beyond that, Pope Francis criticized Archbishop Corleone twice publicly for having uh, said that Pelosi should be denied Holy Communion. And he did it, that his Cordelone did it, in the most generous, loving, some would say he took far too long to discern it and, and was much too compassionate, but he did it in the most compassionate way possible. But yet even still, it's condemned. So it is stunning what's going on now with regard to the infidelity in the church. It, it's, it's a horror story from beginning to end. Well, we've um, been writing a lot on, on our website, sign.org. We've been writing about these kind of things and posting articles like you've been doing now, literally since the internet came around. And it was amazing. We even got the name sign.org. But mm -hmm. um, I'd like to say something per how man hacks at the branches of evil, but heaven goes to the roots. Uh, mm -hmm. This was almost a, a night that I'll never, never forget. I had dinner around the year 2000 with Alice von Hildebrandt. In, in in Philadelphia, it was at a, a Catholic meeting, and she grabbed my elbow, and she knew I had written a lot on Freemasonry in a book I wrote called Hope of the Wicked, and it's about the globalization of, of, of uh, uh, I called it a cabal of evil, which then that, that became the deep state, and yes, it was organized, and it had an agenda, and there was money behind it, and there was a policy movement behind it with groups then like the UN and the you know NGOs and, and governments and frankly some very, very bad people in very, very high places that people like Bella Dodd and 
and you know had even written about how they had placed a, a, a clergy to the highest levels all the way to cardinals who had been communists she wrote that in a book brotherhood of darkness and so alice said something to me at dinner that i've never forgotten she said a leading mason had come to her husband dietrich and and he had told him listen to how profound this is of how understanding how the church works he said, we will destroy your church through obedience, a leading mm -hmm. Mason. So in other words, if, if the Masons can place a man in a very, very high level to where they're, in, they're instrumental and even get them to very high levels, even in the church, we will destroy your church through obedience. They understand how the world, how the clergy work with a bishop to his parish priest. Because if a bishop goes against, if a priest goes against his bishop, he's going to be on the outside looking in, in many, many, all of the way from removed to losing his faculty or laicized or all the way to defrock. So they know how it works. And so that's why they've had an agenda to place people in high places. Yeah, it's absolutely. actually a profound statement. And that's why Padre Pio who incidentally was a very, very big believer in Garabandal, and that's those stories are very, very well known. I must have a good two and a half to three pages in the book of his writings and how he met with Conchita at San Giovanni Rotundo. And even at his death, he asked that Conchita be given, you know, like the little doily that an Italian man wears over his head, I guess, you know, um, in a coffin or either is buried in, he asked that it be given to Conchita. Hmm. So, you know, he was very aware of this and he was also very aware of Freemasonry of how he, um, that this a little bit off subject here, I guess, with Garabandal, but Freemasonry is a very, very big part of the story of Spain. Uh, and, and how, you know, if you look at the Spanish Civil War, um, from 1936 to 39, the communists were very instrumental. I have one footnote where 8,000 clergy and 13 bishops were murdered. And another footnote is 10,000 clergy. And even in Garabandal, you could have been you anywhere in Spain, you knew what was happening with the Spanish Civil War. It's like being in the United States in, in 1860 to 1865. You could not have lived here and, and not have known what was going on. And even the people in Garabandal actually put some of the goods from churches. They actually hit them in a river so they wow. could be protected. So everybody was exposed to that. So there's a great, great part of communism. The South is much more liberal, progressive, communist and they still hate Franco in the South, and the spirituality of Spain is in the North, the Navars, the seminaries, uh, mm. the, you know, where Ignatius of Loyola is there, Loyola, where Dominic was born, Avila, Burgos, and so there's the spirituality was more in the North, and even the people in the Basque area up in that general area of Spain, they very much considered themselves as a part of the apparitions of Bernadette Subaru, because it's such a short distance, you know, over the mm -hmm. mountain into Lord, they very much identified with Bernadette in the north. Okay, so one of the fascinating aspects about um, Garabandal that you bring out is that there's a tie-in to abortion because we're dealing with the early 60s here. That's when a lot of the abortion discussions were going, a lot of the abor illegal abortions already happening, even in America. Uh, I know it started in 1920 in Russia, but it really starts to make an appearance in the Western world um, in, in the 60s, um, Canada legalizing it in 1969, the U.S. shortly thereafter. But I was fascinated to learn that somehow this is already mentioned in Garabandal. Well, it's interesting. The word abortion was never used that I've ever seen. Again, you know, I don't know if you know Sergeant Joe Friday of Dragnet all the way back in the 1950s in the United States. He used to always show up at a crime scene and he'd say, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And so I didn't, you know, I never saw the word abortion. So I literally just, it, it's clearly implied. So I'll tell you what was said. Uh, on the day after Our Lady's last appearance at Garabandal, Conchita asked how someone can kill a child without killing the mother. 
she was asked, now, what gave you that idea? And so, um, although I never saw the word abortion used, but Conchita said, well, the Blessed Mother sp spoke about this, and she let me know that this will happen with the overflowing of the chalice. In the second mes message of June 18, 1965, the, the Virgin said, before the cup was filling up, now it is flowing over. So Conchita said this trembling without being able to visualize what it really implied. She said it disturbed her very much, but that she felt ridiculous because she could not understand at all how this could happen. The Blessed Virgin had not explained it to her, and up until that moment, nobody had been able to explain it at all. So we know, you know, all right, let's picture, you know, in a mountain village that was very, very, very simple. It wasn't primitive. It was a simple village of, of village life in northern Spain back in 1961. And, you know, uh, to show you just how simple at the time of the apparition, which incidentally was contemporaneous with Vatican II, where Vatican took place inside these years. Um, and it was also said that the mass would be suppressed. And so there's mm -hmm. all these things, but the word abortion was, wasn't was used that I could see, but that's clearly what it's about. So how would a very, very young girl, pre where it really became much more rampant through the United States exporting abortion policies, basically through its foreign aid, there was always yeah. a hook in that, that, you know, for social agenda, we'll give you this aid for your dam or your hydroelectric plant, but you have to now promote abortion. So it wasn't that ubiquitous on a global scale. So we know that this was a part of it and things were being done all over the world before it was legalized. Indeed. Now, you mentioned there, uh, Garbandal mentioned the mass being suppressed. Yes. And, and the word suppressed, I always felt the word suppressed, you know, well, let's suppress it, meaning let's kind of bury it a little bit. Let's suppress the evidence, you know, uh, let's put a little pressure on it. I actually went to the dictionary to look at the word suppressed, and there's three or four of them. And, and I found the, the, the last one was to decimate. It's in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And I had never known that aspect of it, but it said, yes, the mass would be suppressed. And many, many people feel that we have seen the suppression, especially more recently of the, of the traditional Latin mass. And don't forget, at the time of Garabandal, the traditional Latin mass was the de facto standard in the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely stunning. Now, we know um, we said in the intro about the status of uh, Garabandal, it's not condemned yet, not fully approved yet. Um, what uh, What's the status with regard to people going there on pilgrimages? Is that permitted or where are we at? Um, since 1961, since the beginning, we have had seven bishops who have basically all taken the same position, some much more favorable, some not as favorable, but... And as Fulton Sheen said, we're all going to hell on our butts. But no bishop has ever totally condemned it. There are three phases in the church without getting into the Latin, which nobody knows anyway. But the, the phrase for leaving it alone is non constat to supernaturality. And, and so we know things like Fatima, Lords, Guadalupe, and others have been approved by the church. So there's flat out approval. And then let's go to the the middle one, which that's the way I, I present them. Um, it, it hasn't been condemned or approved. And the last phase is to where an apparition is outright condemned. And so every bishop has left this alone. And in 2012, the Bishop Zamora, he actually celebrated mass in the village. So there, it, it, the church has been easing up uh, on this. And there was one bishop previously that had, you know, written a letter to every one of his bishops, not, not really wanting them to participate in it, but he never condemned it. And that's very important. And I do think to a certain extent, and I said this in the book, I think to a certain extent, Garabandal has been protected. We know Padre Pio, who had enormous influence on the spirituality of so many people with his fidelity 
to the church where he was silenced all those years where he said the world just lost those graces when I was silenced. But he he was very much in favor of it. We know Mother Teresa very much endorsed it, was public in her affirmation about it, and I put that in the book. And then we know Pope Paul VI, who I have three or four of his quotes, where he is glowing in his appreciation for what was done there. And then even John Paul II, and we know John Paul II had a fairly long run as Pope, and so a lot of bishops, you know, didn't want to co come against their boss. And, and so, you know, they left it alone because of his sentiment. So he, uh, John Paul True, too, through um, uh, his secretary, Bishop Jeevish, wrote a letter of endorsement to a book by a, a man by the name of, a little inscription in the front, in essence, keep up the good work, Al, you know, that kind of thing. And um, we know that John Paul II is in favor of it. In the name of the book that Albrecht Weber wrote, he's a German who was actually born in Austria, very much in fidelity to it, lived there and is even buried there. He wrote a book called Garabandal, The Finger of God. Beautiful. And John Paul yes. II has written a little inscription. So I think to a certain degree, due to the fidelity of many, many people, it's been left alone. And even after Mother Angelica was cured of 42 years of metal leg braces, the one place she went in the entire world after being very much devoted to the infant of Prague and the Sacred Heart, where she was very devoted to that publicly, the place she went to give thanks was Garabandal. Wow. So give us your uh, final comment here. What's the most important thing for you uh, about this? And also, if you can tell us, concluding, where can people go get your book? Um, they can get the book at sign.org. It's called Garabandal, uh, The Warning and the Great Miracle. Subtitle is the divine, the divine Reset That Will Correct the Conscience of the World. But I guess my final parting comment it's it's it, what it was from the very beginning when 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 I've ever heard this. This is an act of grace to a very sinful generation and world of people. This is God's love for humanity manifesting itself in an ultimate act of grace to turn this around, lest all innocence be lost in the world. Unless this happens, I don't see anybody is going to be left standing in the culture. If you take a look at the destruction that has wreaked in our families and in our church through sex, drugs, and rock and roll over the last several generations, this is God playing his hand. And if I've seen anything in this vis-a-vis -vis biblical, biblical events, God has a plan to save his people. And this, in my opinion, is a very, very, very big part of that plan. Absolutely beautiful. Ted Flynn, thank you so much for joining us. Folks, do go check out his website, sign.org, sign and go pick up his book on Garabandal. God bless you. And thank you so much, Ted. Thank you very much. And God bless all of you. And we'll see you next time.